Um, the offer you can't refuse. Um, many people ask me, Stephen, did you use that sentence because it was used in The Godfather? And you probably know the meaning of that sentence when they used it in The Godfather. Well, I can tell you this book is not about how to kill someone or how to murder people. That's not what it is about. It's not where I found the inspiration. And actually, the initial usage of the term, the offer you can't refuse, was used for the first time in 1932 with this movie, Burn em Up, uh, Burn em Up Barnes, uh, which is a movie about uh, an oil field and people wanted to buy that oil field. And, and in that movie, they used the offer you can't refuse for the first time in the meaning that I would like to use it as well. And this is a story about the future of customer experience. This is a story that brings hope, that gives positive energy, and that you know, invites companies to think about how can we eliminate barriers for customers to do business with us, and how can we add value on a, a number of set of dimensions? How can we add value on different layers to make sure that people will buy from us and that they will like to buy from us today, but also in the future? Look, I'm uh, convinced that this is a turning point in human history, what we're seeing right now. And I think that we're at the beginning of a new wave with new customer behavior and new customer expectations. And if you look back in the old world, the new minimum to be in business was having a good product, a good price, and a good service. Well, I think this has changed. And in the past 10 years, digital convenience became part of the new normal. And digital convenience was created by technologies like mobile and social and 4G. And many companies, mainly the big technology companies, they took us on this road, uh, Amazon, Booking.com, Zalando, Apple, Google, Alibaba. They all created this almost you know, perfect transactional relationship between them and their customers. And because of that today, this is just the mo most natural thing in the world. If you have digital convenience, good. If you don't have it, you're in deep trouble. And you know, over time, we will see that, of course, digital convenience can be a little bit stretched. We're in the middle of this evolution, and we've seen this in the last few years. We've seen how companies like Amazon introduced the dash buttons, you know, one click to order a product. We've seen how McDonald's completely reinvented the way that you go to their restaurants and how you order food. We've seen that the unscalable became scalable, like personal coaches. You need, in the past, you had to go to find one and you had to spend time with that personal coach. Today, this can be scaled thanks to artificial intelligence and our mobile phones. We saw the rise of voice assistants moving from a zero click to a, from a one click to a zero click interface. And then COVID-19 hit the planet. And I still call 2020 the year of the biggest digital training course in human history. Everything we do is now digitally. Look at us here tonight. I see your faces on a screen. I could never have imagined that it would, been, that would be like this, but you know, I'm convinced that the person who invented the Zoom interface or the Teams interface, that person must have been a huge fan of the Muppet Show. Uh, because if you look to the way that the Muppets organize themselves, it is exactly the same as we are organizing ourselves today in Zoom or in Teams meetings. We see digital everywhere, and this has a consequence. Uh, if you look outside today, ask yourself the question, do we still see the entire world? I don't think so. I think we see part of the world, because there's this invisible layer of digital technologies that is flying above us, and it's changing the way that we interact with companies. And in the past, we talked about digital versus analog. We talked about online versus offline. Today, it is a hybrid world, where both of those forces come together, and where every interaction that you have with a customer actually will have a digital component. And this will be stretched in the next few years. If you ask me what the future of digital interfaces will look like, well, I'm convinced that these four characteristics will play a role in that. Interfaces will become more invisible than ever before. They will be more personalized, they will require less effort from the customer, and they will be more proactive than ever before. And you know, even in markets that have been functioning in the same way over and over again, like the healthcare industry, you're starting to see changes that completely revamp the entire model, completely rethink the interactions between customers and, uh, and businesses. Take Good Doctor, which is one of the platforms of Chinese insurance company Ping Ang. And this is a platform that if you feel something, if you have pain or some sort of a symptom, you go to their app, you type in the, uh, the symptoms that you have, and in real time, they connect you with a doctor with a video call. And that doctor will make a first assessment to see if, if 
something serious is going on or if you just have a minor issue. If you have a minor issue, they may prescribe you instantly some medication. They bring that to wherever you may be within 30 minutes. And if something serious is going on, they will send you to a physical doctor, to a hospital to do further examinations. But you feel how this is completely changing the way that we interact. Today, if, if I'm in pain, if something's wrong with me, you know, I live in Belgium. I have to take half a day off to, to get the first medical help. I have to make an appointment with my doctor, then I have to wait there in the, in the waiting room. They always let us wait. Then you have the examination, then you have to go to a pharmacy to get the medication, then you go back home. It takes me half a day. And because of that, I'm not that eager to go instantly to a doctor. What if I can do that with a screen and a touch of a button? Well, apparently that's very popular because about 300 million users are now working with Ping Ang. And they're also bringing this back to, to the physical world, that they're using this idea of a hybrid world. Th these are like phone booths, you know, old fashioned bo phone booths, but now they're mobile clinics is what they call them. You go in, and then you have a screen and you have a video call with a doctor and if the doctor prescribes you certain medication, you go to the other side of the mobile clinic and you instantly get your medication. So it's a complete new transactional model and what they're trying to do is optimize every detail of the customer journey. And you can look to all different kind of interfaces that you see, you know, they are more user friendly than ever. Uh, take drones. I still remember my first drone I ever had. My children still talk about that because I was playing with it in our garden and within two minutes that drone ended up in a tree and we never ever saw it again. But today I have this Mavic Mini from DJI and it's extremely user friendly. Like a few months ago we had this family reunion and they asked me, Stephen, take a picture with the drone and you know, I could do it. It's easy as hell to do it. I still have to train a little bit, but it's a lot easier than in the past. Transactional optimization. Digital convenience is becoming the norm, and because of that, it is becoming a commodity. So question is, what is behind that? And you feel how customers are now having other expectations towards organizations, and you need to build upon that. And I work with two dimensions, and this is the core of the Offer You Can't Refuse book. I work with these two dimensions and ask myself the question, how can companies become a partner in life of organizations and how can they add value to society? And the combination of those two dimensions, in combination of course with the minimum needs, creates the offer people can't refuse. Now before I dive into how to create the offer you can't refuse, I want to do a small experiment with you guys and I'm counting on my virtual audience here to participate in this little interactive exercise. All of you know that I'm a huge Disney fan, huh? so there's always a little bit of Disney magic in my presentations. And today I chose for Aladdin. And you all know the story, right? You find the lamp, you rub the lamp, then bam, the genie pops out and you get three wishes. Huh? The genie is like, you are my master, here are your three wishes. And you all know the rules, right? You cannot ask for more wishes, that's not allowed. You cannot ask someone to come back from the dead, that's not allowed. And you cannot ask that someone falls in love with you. All other options are open. So have you ever thought about that? What would be your first wish? I perfectly know what my first wish would be. There's no doubt I know it perfectly. Do you know your first wish? I'm gonna do a small test and the people that are in the Zoom meeting can raise their hands if they recognize their own answer in the options here. Is there someone who asked something for himself? That's what I did. You can raise your hand if you do, okay? We can be honest here, it's a small group of people together. Um, or maybe you ask something for your children, friends, or family. Okay, cool. And is there someone who solved the world problem? Ah, we have uh, one person who solved the world problem, that is fantastic. All the others could also have solved the war in Syria. You could have ended COVID-19. You could have granted Belgium a good working government. But no, you decided to choose something for yourself or your children. Is that something that we should feel bad about? No, but as business people, we need to take this into account. And, and people don't like to hear this, but reality is it's still customer first, planet second. First, if you wanna be successful, you have to help your customers. And on top of that, you can do good for society. But it only works in one direction. If you wanna create the offer you can't refuse, it's about customers. It starts with customers. And ask yourself, how can we become a partner in their life? 
And you know, this is about understanding the human behind the customer. It's about understanding how you can be, become a non-intrusive partner in people's life. It's about understanding the, the movie that plays in the head of your customers. Every person in the world has like a movie with the plan of their life. And we have dreams and fears. We have hopes and, and things that we hope will never happen. How can you play a role in that as an organization? How can you support them in that? Let, let me show you this example. Uh, there's this healthcare insurance company based in New York. It's called Oscar. And in the middle of the big, the big lockdown in New York, there was scarcity of access to doctors. And you know in the US how expensive it is to, to have medical help. So these guys were like, okay, we can help, help our customers here. So what they did was this. They said, look, every customer that we have we're gonna make sure that you have access to a doctor if you need one in as little as 15 minutes, completely for free. You can imagine the value that you bring to the market here. Uh, or if you need a refill of your medication, they take care of that. They help you with that. You know? and, and this is about understanding the, the life journey of people. You know, a customer journey is about optimizing transactions. A life journey is about making sure that the emotional state of your customers is being supported. And it's about helping them in a broader way than you did before. And this works in every industry. Let, let's take Q8, gas stations. These guys are now becoming a partner in mobility. And they are investing in car sharing apps and car sharing uh, options to make sure that they can facilitate mobility. In Belgium, in Antwerp, they have now a parking finder. So if you want to find a parking place, they guide you to the, to the empty spot in the city. But you feel how these organizations are you know, moving further away from the core of their activities, selling gas to people, to becoming a partner in mobility. It's about understanding how you can add value to customers in different ways. Some people tell me, Stephen, I'm, I'm a little bit scared that companies would become a partner in life. I'm a little bit scared that they would go too far. And I think this is a very good point. And the last few years when we were talking about technology, and not the last few years, the entire existence of the human race, we use technology to improve our quality of, of life. And the only question we had was like, can we do this? Can we go to the moon? Yes, we're going to the moon. Can we go to Mars? Yes, we're going to Mars. I think in the next 10 and 20 years, more than ever, we're gonna ask ourselves the question, should we do it? Uh, should we do it? I don't know if you've seen this experiment. This is from um, a test that they've done in, in South Korea where a lady met her deceased child. Her daughter passed away a year or two years ago and then they recreated virtually that little girl and this mother could speak to her daughter that died a few years ago. So you can imagine how intense this must be for this lady meeting a child that no longer lives with you. Uh, and maybe some people would love to do that. It's a very personal thing. But I'm like, when I see this, is this really something that we need in society? What are the, the disadvantages of this? Maybe some people will never be able to say goodbye to their, their loved ones because of this. Uh, and this is 2020, uh, guys. I mean, imagine what we can do in 2025 and 2030 and 2040. I'm convinced that technology will be able to keep people alive forever, that I will be able to speak with my parents for the rest of my life in a digital format. But is this something that we want to do? I don't know the answer to that. But one thing is clear, because of loads of new technologies that are coming our way, like artificial intelligence, robotics, um, quantum computing, we will be able to create new services, new opportunities to the planet that are really cool on the one hand, but I'm also convinced that we will have to think more about, is this something that we want to do? Let, let's bring it closer to home. Eh? Let's bring it closer to our day-to-day -day lives. Take the Halo bracelet that Amazon launched a few, few weeks ago. It's a very cool new gadget. It's like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. They do the same things, but they also add your emotion to it. Based on your voice, they will be able to, to state in which emotional state you are. They will know if you're happy, sad, or angry, for instance. Question is, what does a company like Amazon, what, what can they do with that? I'm not saying that, that this could be a strategy, but imagine that they would know that if you're really happy that you're willing to pay more. 
Uh, what if they know that you're in a very good mood and they just increase prices with 5 or 10% because they know you will buy, you're in a good mood and they know that based on your data. You know, th these are new kind of techniques, new technologies that are coming to a customer that can be very untransparent to people. And the question is, how do we deal with this? This is also part of the life journey story. How can you do this in an ethical way, in a human way? This is also what digital is about. It's not just about automation. It's also about making it human, making it ethical. Partner in life. And then you can build the top of this pyramid, the top of this model. Can you change your world? Uh, and we see a flip in marketing where it used to be an, a focus on authenticity, now it's a focus on responsibility. And, and you feel how society looks to organizations to solve challenges in society. There is a higher level of trust towards companies than in governments. And people are worried about healthcare, about climate, about the rising tide of inequality. And people expect custom companies to take their responsibility. We're facing some big challenges. And all research is pointing in the same direction. Organizations should stand up and deal with that. 74% of the world's population is hoping that CEOs will take their responsibility and will not wait until a government is forcing them to do so. And you know, when you talk about changing the world, maybe that, that's too big, maybe that's too far away, maybe that seems impossible for some organizations. Question is, can we change our world. It's not about changing the world, it's about changing your world. How can you use your strengths and your assets in your organization to have a positive impact on society? Not just with words, but also with actions. How can you combine like consumer activism, where you promote adding value to society with actually taking action? I, I want to show you this example here. A company called Max, it is the oldest hamburger chain that we have in Europe. It's based in the Nordics. And they have fantastic burgers. But I want to ask you guys a question. Do you still remember the tastiest burger you ever had in your life? I can, I can name a few. I can name a few. But the question is, in how many cases was that a burger without red meat? For me personally, my best burger ever was definitely with red meat. And I think the same goes for many of you. And this is the problem for this company, Max, because their ambition is to become climate positive, not neutral, but positive. And to succeed in that, they have to make sure that more than half of the burgers that they sell are actually non-red meat burgers, because red meat is bad for, for the climate. And they succeed in this. And if you will go to their website, you will see how they invest in high quality products that are non-red meat products. They invest more than any other hamburger chain in good chicken products with fish or plant-based meat. They have all these alternatives that are really, really good. And if they have a certain product where they cannot be climate neutral or positive, they alternatively start to plant trees to make sure that they overcompensate. And if you go to their website, you will see that they're extremely transparent about this whole process. But this is typically a company that is talking about it and is also doing it. They are changing their world. And that's the top of this model. Huh? How can you build different components, different layers, to make sure you remove all barriers for people to do business with you? And how can you make them excited on multiple levels in your organization to give them an offer they can't refuse? Look, it's a very interesting year, and um, people expect more than ever. People expect that things go well, and people expect you to do more for the customers these days, and they also expect you to take your responsibility towards society. But don't forget your first wish. Don't forget Aladdin and the genie, because this model only works bottom up. And, and some companies come to me, like NGOs, and they say, Stephen, we're saving the planet. Why aren't we reaching more people? Well, the the answer is usually the bottom of the pyramid is not good enough. Your digital interfaces are just not good enough. And because of that, you only attract a small group of idealists. But to reach the mass market, this model only works bottom up. And this is my invitation to you guys. Think about these different layers in your own organization. Think how far you are. Think where you need to invest more, where you still you know, have some opportunities to grow. And I would like to end with this slide. I use it in all my presentations. It's an invitation. Uh, it's an invitation to, to dream about what is possible. Dream about 2025 and ask yourself, 
what are options, what are, what are strategies, what are actions that I could do to really create that offer people can't refuse, reverse your way back and start building it to win the heart and the business of your customers over and over again and to give them an offer they can't refuse. This is what I had to, to kick off this event for all of you. Uh, I hope it was a good start of the event and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>